and welcome to this special edition of Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle, and during this bonus feature, we're going to talk about my first gun or what it means to own your first handgun, your first defensive handgun. Now, I think that a lot of you out there in the audience, you're either in a position where you just recently purchased your own uh, defensive handgun, or you know someone who's in that position, whether it's a family friend or a relative or somebody that you work with. A lot of you guys who are gun people uh, have had people say to you, well, you know, I'm thinking about getting my first gun, or I think I need to get a gun, or what should I buy, and so forth. And so in the audience right now, we probably have two types of people. We have the people that are thinking about it, they haven't made the decision yet, or they've just purchased their first defensive handgun. And that's really only the first step. You buy a gun, it makes you a gun owner. It doesn't impart the skill to use it, and it doesn't really answer all of the questions. You know, you went out and you purchased, you know, brand X firearm. Now you've got that gun. Great. But owning that gun doesn't tell you how to operate it, what you need to do to be a gun owner. And so what we're going to do in this special bonus feature is we're going to talk about just that. We're going to try and dispel some of the Hollywood myths. And unfortunately, that's where we are in this nation right now. A lot of people who buy guns, their only real experience with guns is seeing them on TV or in the movies. And they think, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, that that's how firearms work. And obviously, that's really not the case. So let's talk about being a uh, first gun owner and uh, hardware. If you haven't made the decision yet, or even if you have, the, a lot of people are like, well, what should I get? I went into the you know into the gun shop and I looked at the counter and they've got all kinds of different guns. They got big guns and small guns. They have revolvers. They have semi-automatic pistols. The guy behind the counter told me that this one is a double action, and he told me this one is a single action. And, you know, this one over here is a safe action or a striker fired. And that's all kinds of information. Like, what does what does that all mean to me, the guy who's going to buy a gun? And I'll tell you, first of all, when it comes to action, you know, when it comes to handgun actions, whether double action, single action, what have you, this is what you need to know. This is all you need to understand is how many jobs does the trigger have? How many tasks does the trigger perform? Now, if the trigger is used to cock the gun, to cock back the firing pin or the hammer, and to release it, then it is a double action trigger. It's not how many ways can you shoot the gun. A lot of people are like, well, you can shoot it one way, you can shoot it this way. No, no. Think about it like this. When it comes to double action, if if it cocks the hammer or the striker and it releases it, then it's double action. Now, there are pistols and revolvers out there that are single action. Now, single action means that the trigger only has one job. The job of the trigger is to release an already cocked hammer or to release an already cocked firing pin. Now, you have semi-automatic pistols and you have semi-automatic, uh, you have revolvers, single action revolvers and single action pistols. Uh, I'll digress real quick. So you say, well, what does that mean? If it's single action, does that mean I have to cock it every time? No, no, no. Uh, now, the only one that falls into that category is a single action revolver. Yes, the old cowboy guns, the 1873 Colt Peacemaker. That is the one that you have to reach up with your thumb and manually cock the hammer, and then you release that hammer with the trigger. A single action pistol, such as the M1911 45 ACP or the Browning High Power or others, when you charge the weapon, that is you put a magazine in it, you pull the slide back, you chamber around, what that does is it cocks the hammer. And then all the trigger does is releases the cocked hammer. Now those aren't very popular for police officers or normal law enforcement. What you'll find today is kind of a, a subcategory of the previous two, and that is a striker fired gun. Now these are probably the most popular firearms in the United States of America today. Now a striker fired gun essentially means that inside of that slide, the top part, there is a striker. The striker hits the primer on the cartridge and makes the gun go bang. But you really don't see it. The striker is housed inside of the slide. Unlike a big hammer that you can pull back on with your thumb, you don't really see the striker. Now, what guns use a striker-fired action? Well, obviously, your Glock pistols do. A Glock pistol is a striker-fired gun. 
Now, it, Glock calls their action, they call it the Glock safe action trigger. Well, what does that mean to you? Does that mean it's extra safe or what have you? Well, what it means is with a Glock pistol, when you insert a magazine and you chamber around, what that does is that presets the striker. It's not completely cocked, but it's cocked about 70%. And when you press the trigger, what that does is it completes the cocking cycle and then it releases it. So it feels a lot lighter than your normal double action trigger press. If you've ever pressed a trigger on a double action revolver or a double action pistol, you're like, wow, that's a really long, heavy trigger press. And your standard traditional double action pistols was, you know, two different feels. You had a double action followed by a bunch of single actions. And quite frankly, that was a very confusing issue, especially for new shooters. And the truth of the matter is a Glock pistol or any other pistol that uses a striker fired mechanism is as a rule, much easier to teach new shooters because you're not trying to teach them two different ways to cycle the gun. You're just teaching them one. Now, what other guns available use the striker fire? Well, you have the Smith & Wesson model M&P, the M&P 9 or the M&P 40 or the M&P 45. Now, they do have competition models that are modified slightly, but the standard duty pistol M&P 9 is a traditional striker-fired action. And then you have the Ruger SR9, which is very similar as well. And you also have the Springfield XD or XDM pistols. Now, all these pistols have uh, standard capacity magazines that hold anywhere from 15 to 17 to 19 rounds, depending on the model. They have a consistent, smooth trigger press. So each trigger press is the same each and every time. It's not overly long. It's not overly heavy, but they're not super lightweight either. These aren't target or competition guns that only have, you know, what they call hair triggers. And I, I kind of like, don't like the term hair trigger, but, you know, a very, very light trigger. If you're going to shoot a competition or a match and you're going to be standing still, you want a very, very smooth let off or a crisp trigger. But if it's a duty gun, if it's a gun you're going to carry to save your life. You don't want that real, you know, light trigger. You want an overly light trigger. So a standard factory trigger on either a Glock, a Smith & Wesson M&P, the Ruger SR9, or the uh, Smith and, or Springfield Armory XDM should do you very well. So there is our, our semi-automatic versus revolver DASA. So when people are telling you things like, you know, this is a double action, this is a single action, this is whatever. What you need to ask yourself is, what does the trigger do? How many jobs does it have? If, the, if it has two jobs, it's a double action trigger. If the trigger performs only one function, releasing uh, the hammer, then it's a single action. Caliber choice. Let's talk about caliber choice. Uh, there's a lot of dissension in the United States because gun people love to argue with each other. <laughs> That's one of our favorite pastimes of gun owners and gun people is arguing with each other over what is the best, you know, the best widget, the coolest, you know, the newest, coolest hammer, what have you. Now, when it comes to caliber choices for personal defense, this is what I will tell you. I would not use a handgun to save my own life that was chambered in a caliber below 0.35 or a 38 caliber. Now you say, well, what does that mean, Paul? When it comes to actual size, the 38 special, the bullet is actually 0.357 inches in diameter. A lot of you guys might not have known that, but the 38 special is actually 0.357. The 9 millimeter is 0.355, I believe. And uh, a 380 is very similar, 0.355. They're all around 35 caliber. That is the minimum that I would go for for a personal defense gun. Now you say, what about maximums? Well, you have have, you know, 45 caliber pistols, you have 44 caliber pistols and revolvers. Um, but think about it like this. Uh, a handgun really is no more than a rifle waiting to grow up. And that was a, a something that was taught to me by an instructor uh, a few years ago. He said, let's put it that way. He goes, a lot of guys, people are always trying to, they're always trying to force a handgun to be a rifle or make a handgun into a rifle. A handgun's never going to be as powerful or as effective as a rifle. But you can't carry rifles with you everywhere you go. When you get up in the morning and you go to your work or the grocery store or shopping or the movies or whatever, you can't carry a rifle. Generally, they frown upon that. 
You, know, you walk through the movie theater with a rifle on, they get really excited. So why do we carry handguns? We carry handguns because that's something that we can conveniently have on our person concealed so no one else knows about it, and we can keep both of our you know left and right hands free. That's why we carry handguns. We don't carry them because they're super powerful and they're the best, most effective man killers in the world. We carry them because they're convenient. Now, when it comes to that, if, if we accept that fact that we're carrying handguns because they're convenient to carry, then we need to ask ourselves, ourselves, how are we going to use this? Are we going to use it in a defensive scenario or are we going to hunt white-tailed deer with it? If you're going to use it in a defensive scenario, a defensive scenario may include things such as a really big, nasty, drugged-up attacker, more than one attacker, several, two or three attackers. Uh, you need to factor in the fact that when you're being attacked when you're involved in the most horrible, you know, stressful, heinous uh, act, that of defending your own life against a killer, you could miss. And chances are you probably will miss with one or two shots or three or what have you. If you start out with only five shots and the first two miss, the second two hit you know, a peripherally, uh, you could be empty really, really quick. You need to understand that. People are like, well, how many is enough? Well, I don't know about you, but if I was ever involved in a gunfight and I would prefer to have ammo left over than to run out in the middle. Ask yourself that when you talk to your reasonable friends or people who would give you reasonable advice. Say, well, would you rather run out in the middle of the fight or would you rather finish the fight and have some left over? There's no penalty for having rounds left over at the end of the fight. Yeah, I actually was in a gun shop, oh, what, two, three months ago, Jared? Yeah, Jared's like three months ago. And uh, I was over, I was listening to the guy behind the counter, and it was a woman, and she was up there, and she was uh, going to purchase her first handgun, and she was looking for a defensive handgun. And he was trying to, to get her to buy a, um, it was some kind of a five-shot 38 special compact revolver. And not that those are bad tools, but what he told her is, well, don't worry so much about how many rounds the gun holds, because if you can't get it done in the first couple shots, you probably can't get it done. And I thought to myself, wow, that's, I don't even know how to address that. Well, then why don't police officers carry three shot guns? You know, the, by that logic, every police officer should have a gun that holds no more than five rounds because by this gentleman's logic behind the counter there, if you can't get the job done with the first couple shots, it's not going to get done. So why bother? Well, the reason we carry guns that hold more than five or six or seven shots is because we don't know. There could be a bad person who approaches you and you tell them to stop. They don't stop. You pull your gun out, point it at them, and they stop. You don't fire a shot. Okay, you got five rounds left over or six or 10 or 12. Fantastic. That is a, that is a win for the home team right there. But you may have a person who's in the middle of trying to kill you and they're not even noticing or caring about the gunfire that's coming out of your little pistol. And until you put enough bullets in them to interrupt their central nervous system uh, or to make them bleed out, they're not going to stop trying to kill you. How many is that going to take? I don't know. During the Miami shootout, uh, I believe it was Mr. Platt was shot in. He had, I believe, 33 bullet wounds in his body when he finally gave up the ghost and expired. Did you hear that? 33, not two or four. Now, granted, some of them were in his arms, his legs, his feet, his chest, but he had a whole bunch of them in his torso. And they were handgun rounds and some, and finally a couple of, uh, uh, rounds directly to his cranium by, uh, Ed Morales made him stop misbehaving. But the, the problem or the issue you guys need to think about is you don't know. You don't know when you start out. So don't let somebody talk you out of some, uh, let's say you go to the store and, and you find a, uh, a compact Smith and Wesson M&P nine, uh, or a Glock 19 and you want and you want to get it and it holds, you know, Glock 19 starts out with 15 rounds and someone's like, Oh, why do you think you need that many rounds? Well, I don't think that I need that many, but I'd rather have some left over than run out in the middle of the fight. Thank you for your advice. Uh, and now what kind do you want to choose? If you're really bunged up, 
If you're like, dude, I just, I don't know whether it's 9, 40, 45, 357, SIG, 38, what should I get? If you're really bunged up about it, this is what I'm going to tell you. Find out what your local sheriff's department or police department is carrying. Find out what kind of, you know, guns they carry, find out what caliber they are, and then buy that. I mean, if if you just can't make up your mind, do that. And then at very least, when someone questions you about it, why did you think you needed to buy that gun? Say, well, this is what the Lackawanna Sheriff's Department carries, or this is what the Broward County Sheriff's Department carries. And I figured if it was good enough for the sheriff's office to save their lives, it's good enough to save my life. So uh, don't don't spend you know, hours agonizing over caliber. One thing I would stay away from though is the, the guys that tell you, Oh, you don't need anything more than a 22 because everything else is just overkill. <laughs> Ask that same guy if you'd ever go deer hunting with a 22 rifle. Unless he's a poacher, the answer is probably no. Um, let's talk about actually going out to the range and shooting. Now, when you get your gun, you've got it and, uh, there's lots of different types of ammunition out there and you need to understand this. There's ammunition that is manufactured deliberately to be used as less expensive practice ammo. And then there's ammunition that's manufactured to be used as personal defense or premium ammunition. Now, the premium ammunition costs a lot more. And the reason it does is because the manufacturers put their absolute best you know, components into the premium ammunition because they know that's what people are going to use to save their lives. Now, I'm not telling you that... The uh, practice ammo is junk, but what I'm telling you is that they put more quality control steps and they put higher quality components, bullets, cases, powder, primers, all that stuff. They put more time and effort into building defensive ammo, you know, and you'll know because the box will be marked personal defense, law enforcement, home defense, what have you. And then you have, and you don't want to go to the range and you don't want to be shooting that all up. Now, what I would do if I had a, a handgun and I was going to choose, let's say, a Winchester Corbon, Remington, uh, Federal Load uh, for self-defense, I'd run a magazine or two of that ammo through my gun to make sure that that gun, you know, will reliably feed it. But after that, choose the less expensive practice ammunition and, uh, and you'll be served just fine. Now, when you get out to the range, make sure that you protect your eyes and your ears all the time, every time. When I was a young Marine, I still remember this. I remember, you know, crusty old gunnery sergeants or first sergeants, you know, like, ah, your ears will get used to it. They'll tough it up over time. Yeah, it's called going deaf. Okay, your ears don't get used to gunfire. They don't toughen up. They're slowly but surely being destroyed. Protect your ears every single time you go. If you're going to be, and wrap, and the thing about with ear protection is if you're standing there and someone fires a shot, your ears ring, you know, you cover your ears and you're like, oh, you know, hang on, let me put my earplugs in. If you catch a piece of debris in an unprotected eye, that's a, a lot bigger of a situation or more serious of a situation. Don't ever step onto a shooting range on purpose without some type of shatterproof uh, wraparound eye protection on your eyes. Always have something between your eyes and the gun because it, you're not necessarily worried about bullets uh, striking your eyes. You're worried about debris. I mean, when you fire a gun, it, the powder is turning instantly from a solid into a gas. It's creating hot burning gas. And that gas is going to get out there and get in your face. You could get dust, debris, um, and people, if people are shooting around you, the guys on your left and right, a lot of times when people get uh, injuries to their eyes, it's not because of what they were doing. It's because what the people around them were doing. So always protect your eyes. Take the time to buy, you know, a good quality set of protective eyewear. And if you're going to be shooting indoors, uh, if you're going to be shooting in an indoor range, I would always use muffs. Plugs just don't quite get it because you're, the, the bones around your ears, if you're indoors and you just have plugs in, those bones are still being impacted by that noise, that, that shot, that sound wave is banging on them and that transfers that up into your ear canal. So when I, when I shoot indoors, I'll put a set of foamy plugs in and then I'll put muffs on top of those. 
If you're going to go to a school, if you're going to planning on attending a, a training academy or a school, I would definitely invest uh, the 40 or $50 or $60, whatever it is, in a set of electronic hearing muffs, electronic muffs. Now, these electronic muffs, what they do is they cut out the harsh ear damaging, you know, sounds, but they amplify the soft sounds such as an instructor talking to you. And if you don't have those, what you'll have to do in the class is you'll have to keep taking your earmuffs off, listening, putting them back on, off, on, off all day long. You're better off just to get a set of electronic muffs, turn them on, and then you can hear the instructions uh, from your instructors and your teachers. That'll always uh, be the best choice. Now, let's talk about care and maintenance of your firearm. Think about it like this. A firearm really is no more than a simple machine. That's what it is. Uh, there's nothing magical about it. Um, it didn't come out of the, you know, before it left the factory, a wizard did not cast a spell of imperviousness over your gun. It's just a simple machine. It's made of steel and aluminum, you know, polymer, maybe a little bit of wood, you know, thrown in there. But and how do machines work best? How does your truck work best? How does your chainsaw or your lawnmower, how do they work best? Do they work best when they're dirty and dry or do they work best when they're clean and well lubricated? Well, obviously the answer is they work the best when they're cleaned and well lubricated. And you say, well, how much is enough? How, or how much is too much? If you pick up the gun and it falls out of your hand because it has so much oil out of it on it, that's too much. If you pick up the gun and you shake it and flicks of oil go through the air and get on your face, that's too much. Essentially, um, you should be able to see it or you should, um, if, if wherever metal is running against metal, let's say your slide, the slide in the frame, any place that metal is rubbing against metal needs to have a liberal or a heavy amount of oil on it. You should be able to actually see the oil on it. Any other place where you're just going to put your hands, you can take a cloth uh, and put a little bit of cleaning oil on it and rub it down very, very lightly. Now, if you have a polymer frame gun like an M&P or a Glock or an XD, you don't need to put anything on the outside of the polymer because guess what? Polymer doesn't rust and, and there's no moving parts on the outside grip frame of your gun. So don't have, you don't have to worry about that. What you need to worry about is you need to worry about um, cleaning out the barrel every once in a while. Take a, the brush. Most The nice thing about quality factory guns right now is the vast majority of them come with a basic cleaning kit. And you can get as fancy or as simple as you want, but usually, uh, except for the gun oil, the kit that you got with the gun uh, is all you'll need, plus maybe one of those, uh, all what they call an all-purpose brush. It looks like a heavy-duty toothbrush to scrub some of the carbon off of it. Now, carbon is simply a byproduct of the powder turning from a solid to a gas. What happens after that? It leaves carbon residue behind. Now, carbon is not a horrible thing, but over time, carbon will build up, you know, on the face, uh, on, the, on your in your chamber area, uh, on the bolt face, or the face of the slide by the firing pin hole. And all you really need to do is take your your all-purpose brush, put a little bit of oil on it, and just scrub it, just a little elbow grease. But the main thing you need to worry about for semi-automatic firearms is that the rails or the slide, like I said, anywhere where metal is moving against metal, you need to make sure that there's some lubrication on there. Uh, and it's really not that, that not that difficult. Now, I don't know what kind of gun you have in your hot little hands out there. So do yourself a favor, and I know this is going to be hard for you guys. Because guys don't like to read. They just want to do. But if it's a brand new gun, take the time to pull out the manual and read exactly what the manufacturer recommends as far as disassembly and reassembly. Uh, most modern firearms are very, very simple to disassemble, and they, uh, they should require no tools. If it requires a tool, I would say that's strange here in 2013 to need a tool to disassemble it. <laughs> if you get to the point where you're looking for tools to take your gun apart, stop. Stop yourself and read the manual. Because off the top of my head, let me see, Beretta 92, Glock 17, SIG 226, XDM, none of those require tools in order to be disassembled and cleaned. So if you're looking for hammers and screwdrivers to take your gun apart, 
stop yourself and ask if you really, really want to do that. Okay. <laughs> now uh, I've had a lot of people say, well, okay, I bought my gun. I cleaned it. I read all about it and I took it to the range. And I shot 25 rounds through it. Now what do I do? Well, it depends. Do you want to take the fast track or do you want to take the slow track? If you want, if you're content to take the slow track, what you do is you try to train yourself. You, know, you go to the range once a week, once a month, buy 50 rounds and you stand out there in the range and listen to the local, you know, gun range expert tell you what he thinks you should be doing. Oh, uh, that is the slow way to do it. If you want to get on the fast track to knowledge and experience, what you do is you suck it up and you book yourself a seat in a class in a professional shooting school. And there's lots of them out there. Just get on the Internet and Google them. You, tactical response, tactical defense uh, or TDI uh, in Ohio, the SIG Academy, Gunsight Academy, Texas Pistol Academy, ITTS in Ca California. There's lots of them out there. Figure out where you are on planet Earth and, and who's relatively close to you or, or who you're, you know, where you're willing to travel to and get yourself in a good two to three day course. Because in that course, you'll spend more time with that gun, more time shooting, more time on the range with professional trained instructors than you would in years of trying to do it yourself. Yes, I know it will require time and effort and money, but you have to ask yourself, you know, am I worth it? You're not doing, you know, you're not taking this training to impress your friends or your family members or other people. You're doing it for you. That's, I mean, think about it like that. Am I going to training to impress other people or am I going to this training for me? And it should be for you. That's why you should be going. If you're, if you're doing it for somebody else, you're wasting your time. So if, if you want the, the fast track, take the time, book yourself into a school, contact the school, you know, they'll tell you what you need to go and, 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 you know, bring it out there. Now, if, let's say, okay, I booked myself in a school and it's going to be six months. Or they said, or four months or what have you, but I want to do something now. All right. Fantastic. There's lots of books that you can read, lots of videos that you can watch. Now keep in mind, reading a book and watching a video or a DVD is not the same as training. Books and DVDs add to or enhance your knowledge about firearms and firearms handling. And they give you different things, you know, ideas and things to think about. Uh, but you can't just, it's like, I couldn't just read a book and figure out how to drive a car. I could read a book and figure out how to turn the car on. But I'm not going to be entering the Indianapolis uh, 500 because I read a book on fast driving. That's not how it works. So take the time. If you want to add to your knowledge base, fantastic. Uh, if you go to studentofthegun.com, obviously uh, at the homeroom sections, we, we have, you know, little, uh, little weekly snippets uh, and, and training tips. Uh, if you go to our, our website, you can watch the show. We've got lots of free information out there. And a lot of you guys might have questions and we may have already answered them through the material that we put up on studentofthegun.com. So after you listen to this podcast, take a time, take a moment to check. Uh, Check that out. So uh, also training versus practice. I want to make sure that I make this uh, this point to you. Say training is what you do under the watchful eye of a qualified and professional instructor. You can't train yourself. Olympic athletes have coaches and instructors, even gold medal winning athletes still have coaches. They still have instructors and Training is what you do at a school or under the watchful eye of a professional instructor. Now, practice is what you do after you've taken the training. You go to training. They teach you what to do. They tell you what you need to do to improve. Then you go and you take yourself home and on your home range. That's where you practice what you've already been taught. People are like, well, I'm going to go to the range today and I'm going to do some training. Unless they're going to go with a and, and spend some time with another person who can critique them, they're not really training. They're just practicing. So there, there is a difference between training and practice. So, folks, I, I'm glad that you joined us today. If, if you are one of the many people that uh, is a first-time gun owner or very soon to be a first-time gun owner, welcome to the fold. Remember this. When it comes to being a student of the gun, you're a beginner once, but you should be a student for life.